Welcome to the Profitable Painter Podcast. The mission of this podcast is simple, to help you navigate the financial and tax aspects of starting, running, and scaling a professional painting business. From the brushes and ladders to the spreadsheets and balance sheets, we've got you covered. But before we dive in, a quick word of caution. While we strive to provide accurate and up-to-date financial and tax information, nothing you hear on this podcast should be considered as financial advice specifically for you or your business. We're here to share general knowledge and experiences, not to replace the tailored advice you get from a professional financial advisor or tax consultant. We strongly recommend you seeking individualized advice before making any significant financial decisions. This is Daniel, the founder of Bookkeeping for Painters. And this is Richard, tax director. How's it going today, Daniel? It's a beautiful summer day. It's July 4th today that we're recording this. It is. Yeah. Happy Independence Day. Yeah. Uh, here in America, we're enjoying a day off. I guess they don't get that over in the UK, do they? The, I don't think so. Maybe that, this, That's what happens when you lose working. the war, right? <laughs> it is. Yeah, they're still working today. So. Uh, well, hopefully our, our, our UK listeners, if we have any UK listeners um, who like to hear about American tax code, uh, are, are having a good day anyway. Uh, I thought today being a holiday that we might be able to do something a little a little fun, a little bit different. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like painting adjacent uh, because a lot of our listeners do have pets that they love and that are members of their family. And I thought, wouldn't it be awesome if we could get tax deductions for having a pet? And we don't recommend anything shady or, or anything, you know, not legal. But there are some certain circumstances where you might be able to get, you know, some kind of a tax write off involving your dog or your cat or another, you know, animal uh, that that you have. Uh, and we we need these tax write-offs, right? Because having a pet is expensive. Oh my goodness! So I was I was trying to Google some statistics, and I came across this one from the Bureau of Labor that says the average U.S. household spends seven hundred and seventy dollars per year on pet food, medical expenses, supplies, and toys, and uh, that that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Especially on the pet food, like, I feel, I don't, it's weird to me that, you know, didn't dogs evolve from wolves and they were with us humans and they, like, they started, like, we'd feed them scraps and they provide, like, early warning um, to us for predators and stuff like that. So they evolved with us. And we fed them just the food that we were eating. But for some, at some point we started like buying special food for them that, you know, we pay a premium for. I don't understand that thing. Just feed them table scraps. That's what they've been living off of for hundreds of thousands of years. Right. Well, if you come to my house, my dog gets her pet food, her pricey pet food and table scraps. So I, I think the dogs kind of know what they're doing here. Like they've they've got <laughs> they're gaming the system. They're getting the best of both worlds. But, yeah, <laughs> De- definitely. I mean, it's definitely get good to get in on an apex predator that you know rules the world. They definitely game the system there. Right. Yeah. No. They're and, you know, and the thing is like yeah. So we spend we spend a lot of money on our, our furry friends, but the the value that they bring us is not something that we can really measure in dollars and cents. But we're gonna try. Uh, <laughs> so how can you you know possibly get some tax write offs for your pet? I came up with five ways, uh, and I'm just gonna say right off the bat, one of the ways is not claiming them as a dependent. Uh, yes, they are dependent on us. Yes, they are our fur babies, but the IRS is not going to let you get a child tax credit for an animal, uh, unless that animal maybe has a social security number, but, but even then I think you, you would struggle, but right. here are some, right? Yeah. Humans are animals. Uh, yeah. So. Oh, do, should I say non-human animals with that? Would non-human that animals. Yeah. I had to explain this to my daughter, uh, this week. So she she didn't realize that humans are animals, and we had to have that discussion. Like so, yeah. 
I love it. We're 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 doing we're doing tax advice. We're doing biology. We're doing <laughs> all sorts of things today. Um, so okay. So when I say animals, I mean non-human animals. Usually talking about dogs or cats, but there might be situations where horses, pigs, cows, chickens. We'll we'll get into that. All right. So <laughs> number one. All right. Stop burying the lead. Right. Number one is uh, medical expenses. And we're talking about like medical expenses for you and your family. Uh, there are about a half a million service dogs in the country right now, assisting about 27% of Americans who have some kind of medical condition. That's crazy. Just want to highlight that. Yeah. <laughs> that's so many dog service dogs, a half a million. That's, that's the number that Google popped up for me. So you know, feel feel free to challenge it. Uh, but that that's what I was able to come up with about a half a million service dogs. And uh, I don't know if that includes other helper animals, but uh, yeah, about 27% of Americans. So, you know, more and more doctors are prescribing service animals or recommending that patients invest in some kind of a service animal. Uh, for all sorts of, of conditions like anxiety, depression, autism, and then of course, you know, physical and, and mental disabilities. So the question is, is if you have a service animal, is that animal and the expenses around it tax deductible? And this is where, you know, the devil's in the details. And you may or may not agree with with the way it's written, but this is just kind of how the IRS is handling it right now. So it, it's not specifically, Congress did not specifically write out which service animals count and which ones don't. But generally speaking, the IRS is going to allow a deduction only if a service animal or guide dog meets the definition that the Americans with Disability Act set out, uh, which is an animal that is trained to do work or perform tasks for people with disabilities. So, you know, we're thinking like a guide dog for someone who is blind, um, you know, someone who is disabled, an animal that can that can answer the door, that can help them get ready in the morning. But we've also seen support for uh, animals that assist those who have mental or psychiatric uh, issues. So folks who suffer from PTSD, severe anxiety or, or depression uh, who have a certified service animal could probably take a tax deduction for you know the cost of obtaining the animal, its food, its training, supplies, equipment, whatever you know is, is involved. Now unfortunately, uh, the IRS will usually disallow a deduction if the uh, service animal is an emotional support animal or a therapy animal for folks who have undiagnosed conditions. Uh, now, this isn't a hard and fast thing, but generally uh, the IRS is not going to allow deduction for, for emotional support animals. Uh, if you really want to kind of get into the weeds on this, I recommend IRS Publication 502. It's also a great read if you can't sleep at night but it spells out everything that is a medical expense that can be deducted. Once so you suffering, out, So if you're suffering from insomnia, IRS Pub yes. 502, got it. Yes. And then can you write off the cost of getting publication 502 to treat your insomnia? It, it's just like, it's like a circle, right? The state yeah. fail. No. Uh, once you figure out if if it really is a medical expense, then you got to decide, well, how am I going to take the deduction? And that we can do a whole podcast on that. Uh, but you've got a lot of options, you know, from itemizing on Schedule A, which honestly is probably the least uh, best way of doing it or, 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 the, or the least advantageous way of doing it uh, to using a flexible spending account or a health savings account. Or if you are a business owner and you have a health reimbursement account arrangement, uh, that would probably be ideal. But uh, just just trying to identify, does my service animal qualify as a medical expense? And then how am I going to take that medical expense in the most tax advantaged way? So that's number one. Number two, uh, and I, 
you know, we were talking before the podcast. I I'm I like this one a lot for our our business owners. That is using a guard dog, right? Using an animal for security. So you might have a a shop that you work out of, or maybe you store materials and inventory at your house, an outbuilding or a garage, and you might need to have some kind of security or you know protection set up so that you know hoodlums don't come in and, and take all your stuff. Uh, and a guard dog might make sense, right? Especially when you compare it to the cost of some of the fancy you know electronic systems available now. A guard dog could could be make financial sense. Uh, so there's no there's no real definition for what a guard dog is, but we want an animal that you know works for providing security. So we're thinking, you know, German shepherds, Rottweilers, um, you know, Dobermans, uh, you know, a 12 year old Chihuahua with only one good eye probably is not going to pass, you know, the test as a guard dog. Uh, because, you know, we, we want this to be a justifiable, you know, legitimate thing. Uh, if you do have a guard dog, you can deduct the cost of the food, the vet bills, training. Uh, you can also deduct the cost of obtaining the guard dog. But this is kind of funny, you know, uh, technically speaking, this would be uh, a business asset. And the IRS has assigned a useful life of seven years to, to this asset. So if it's a very expensive guard dog and you have to capitalize it, you may need to depreciate it over a seven-year useful life. That's um, seven human years, not seven dog years. Uh, of course, you could always use bonus depreciation or Section 179 to, to write it off in the first year. Uh, and of course, you know, keep good records. And remember, if you do get audited or the IRS asks you, this is a guard dog that is provided for security. This is not, you know, Fluffy or Fido, uh, even though the kids might occasionally play with it. Yeah, this is a good one. There's a lot of folks that are that have shops out of their garage or their shed and this makes a lot of sense so i i definitely look into this if you have a a dog that uh, you know i know you said like a german shepherd rottweiler pitbull doberman those types of dogs but even some of the small dogs they're good for early warning i don't know i i don't i don't know if there's any uh tax case law on uh using like a, a chihuahua as your your guard dog because like a really I'm, mean chihuahua. Yeah, because there are a lot of those. Like it seems like the smaller the dog, or like those really tiny dogs are really vicious, even though they couldn't really hurt you, but they're like loud and annoying. Mm -hmm. They could be a good uh like a siren, basically. Yeah. No, I mean it, again, there's no there's no like set list of appropriate breeds. You have to use your good judgment. I was just kind of making the point that you know, whatever animal you use, it should make sense. So, yeah, I mean, if you have a, a particularly young and aggressive Chihuahua that works well, by all means, um, you know, because, uh, again, we, you know, th this isn't a family pet. We're, we're, we have this animal for a purpose, so it needs to be able to, to you know, provide that purpose of security. Uh, all right. So number three uh, is kind of along the same lines, except we're going to switch from dogs to cats. And there is case law for this one, uh, and that is using cats for pest control. So the dog keeps away the bad guys. The cats can keep away the mice, the rats, the snakes, uh, and things like that. There was a 2001 IRS court case. It was uh, Samuel T. Seawright versus the commissioner. And the Seawrights were a couple who owned a junkyard in New Jersey, and they put out uh, cat food to attract feral cats to keep all the, the mice and snakes out of the junkyard. And they wanted to deduct $300 on their tax return for cat food. It was challenged and it went all the way to tax court. And the court sided with the sea rights saying that this was a ordinary and necessary business expense. Uh, you know, the thing with ordinary and necessary, it doesn't necessarily have to be ordinary for you it needs to be ordinary for the trade or the business that you are performing. So we think about like here in the Midwest, we, we have a lot of farms and almost every farmer has at least one or two barn cats. 
whose job is to keep the mice out of the feed. And they might put out some cat food for them to keep them, you know, in, in the barn. Don't put out too much cat food because then, you know, they might not want to eat the mice. I, I don't know. You'd have to, to talk to an expert about that. What if you put out dog food for your guard dog and then you have a cat to keep the mice out of your dog food? Right. This is like the children's nursery rhyme, right? <laughs> the, the spider ate the fly, the cat ate the spider, the dog ate the cat. No. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, we're, we're, we're talking about possibilities here. I mean, you obviously use your own good judgment. Uh, you may not want your your inventory shed to be filled with cats either. So that's something to consider. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if if you did have you know, a problem with mice and you decided to keep a couple of barn cats around, yeah, you can write off the expenses for that, sure. We have case law. Uh, so so now we're going to kind of get into um, a, a little bit less business and a little bit more about maybe something that you have already been doing personally, but is it a hobby or could it be a legitimate business with deductions? So uh, sometimes people like to breed dogs or cats, and sometimes they like to show them in like competitions or shows. Um, you know, personally, we we got our fur baby Elsa from a, a coworker of mine who bred. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, who had uh, the father and the mother, and she would breed the puppies and she would sell them, uh, and you know that was her that was her side gig. Now. Is she doing this as a hobby or is she doing it as a legitimate business that has a profit motive? A hobby is something that it doesn't matter to you if you make money or not. And in that case, you don't have any tax write-offs. You have to claim the income, but you don't get to write off any of the expenses. But if you have a legitimate business with a profit motive and maybe a, a quick one-page business plan, even better yet, a separate checking account, uh, then you can, well, you'll still have to claim the income, always have to claim the income, but you can also write off some of the expenses, like the food, the vet bills, the bedding, things like that. The trick is, is that you are going to need to file a Schedule C tax return and let the IRS know about your business. And you're going to want to show at least some profit some of the years. Uh, if you file a Schedule C with nothing but losses for three, four, five years straight, you're waving a big red flag and you're telling the IRS that this isn't a legitimate business. This is just me trying to write off my hobbies. So, you know, I'm not saying you can't have a loss because because businesses have losses. You might even have a loss for, you know, a couple of years in a row. But eventually you are going to want to show some kind of a profit to justify that this is a business and not just a hobby. Uh, so yeah, so if you are, are breeding animals or showing them in shows, uh, you might be able to to turn that into a legitimate side business and write off those expenses. Uh, another another one has to do with an animal that is part of your provided services. Uh, so think about like maybe uh, you go to a bed and breakfast, and part of this bed and breakfast experience is the cat that lives in the house and they use the cat in the advertising and the cat joins you for breakfast which i don't know if that's sanitary or not but sometimes people like that uh cat cafes is a good example uh if you want to get a latte with a side of fur these animals are part of the experience that is being sold and therefore they are legitimate business expenses now uh, it might be a little bit of a stretch for a painting company owner. Uh, I was thinking of my my brother-in-law. He owns a carpet cleaning company. It's called Sea Spots Run. So shout out to Kevin. Sea uh, Spots Run, Southern Wisconsin, Northern Illinois. And he has a big cat and dog on the side of his carpet cleaning vehicle. It's part of his advertising. If he had a dog that ran around with him, and he used the dog in, you know, part of his provided services, then that dog might be a legitimate business expense. So I don't know if that's something that can be kind of parlayed into a painting company, uh, but uh, 
you know, animals that are a part of your business, they can be a deduction. Uh, now, regardless of whether or not you're able to actually take tax deductions for your pets, we do kind of want to think about what's going to happen to them uh, if something was to happen to you. So I strongly recommend that, you know, your, your pet be a part of your estate planning, that you have a caregiver set aside for your animal if something was to happen to you. And you might even try to assign a little bit of money to that caregiver from your estate so that they uh, they will have the funds needed to to take care of them. You know, uh, my wife and I, we're currently working on our estate plan. Part of our uh, revocable living trust is that our dog Elsa is given a guardian and that guardian is given $5,000 out of our estate to take care of Elsa uh, and help with her expenses. So just, just something to put out there, you know, make sure your pets are, are part of your estate plan so that they're cared for if heaven forbid something was to happen to you and your family. Cool. Well, I, I think I like, uh, I like some of these ideas. I said some of them. I mean, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> no, it was good stuff. I especially like the, the guard dog one. Um, that, that could definitely be applicable for pretty much, uh, I would say 80% of painting business we talk to, they have usually have some sort of shop. I would imagine all, most of them have pets, at least most, most folks, um, but if they have a dog, that would make the most sense in that scenario. The cat for pest control could apply maybe to a lot of folks have a homestead or something like that, that they, they might do something in addition to their painting business. And, uh, and obviously medical expenses, if that specific scenario applies, that would make sense. But uh, I'm trying to think of like a, a painting business name that would use like a, a dog or a cat in your name and, and then kind of just, like you said, use that as like your mascot, feature them somehow in the experience of getting your house painted. I don't know. I've, there might be something there. Yeah. I, I, I say, I tell you, if, if anyone has an idea or or better yet, if anyone's actually using uh, a dog or a cat in their painting business, you got you got to let us know. I really want to know. You got to join the Facebook group, put it in the comments, because I would love to see, I'd love to see how you're doing it. Um you know, it does require thinking outside the box for sure. Uh, and dotting your I's and crossing your T's. I will say, I will say this. Uh, I was at a tax conference last month and I talked to a CPA. He has a client who owns cattle inside of his IRA and he buys and sells cattle uh, in, in his self-directed IRA. I thought that was awesome. Like, yeah, <laughs> like going, you know, he, and, and you'll never guess what state he's from. It starts with T and ends in excess, uh, but it's pretty common down there. Uh, I've also heard of people uh, raising like cows, pigs and steers, and then uh, using them at like state fairs or, um, you know, 4-H gatherings. Uh, the kids can use them for the rodeo shows or they might use them as petting farms. So there's definitely some creative ways. If you're an animal lover and, and you want to make your animals part of your business, there's definitely ways of doing it. Uh, but it does require a little bit of creativity uh, and thinking outside the box. Yeah, I like it. All right, cool. Well, with that, we will see you all next week.